Good morning, church. Welcome to Redford Aldersgate. I'm Reverend Ben Bauer. It is a joy to be with you on this first Sunday of Epiphany. Friends, if you're a guest that's visiting with us, I want to extend a special welcome to you. We're a church that seeks to make Christ's love visible through inclusivity, hospitality, and service. We're a church where we are black and white, where we're LGBTQ and straight, we're rich and poor and differently abled. We come as we are to worship because God has loved us and invited us to be in worship today. So friends, let's join in celebrating and worshiping this amazing God of ours. Amen. Friends, please be sure to comment on or interact with the video feed while you're here with us today so that you can interact with each other and with us while you're in worship. Also, visitors, be sure to like our Facebook page or like and subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you can stay up to date as things change around the life of the church. Again, friends, we will continue to be monitoring um, the, the pandemic and seeing how things are going. Uh, we are hoping to be uh, in a place where we can begin to bring people back to in-person worship. Um, right now, I think we're looking at February for that, but we'll keep a track of the, the data that we're, uh, that's available to us, the publicly available data. We're primarily looking at our uh, percentage of positive cases that are coming back from testing. Uh, once that gets to around 3%, that means that we have a pretty good idea of where the pandemic is at, where people are getting sick at, and that allows for accurate results for contact tracing. And so we want to make sure that we are being good partners and stewards of the gifts and the work that God has given to us and the people around us. So we'll be looking for that, and as soon as I have more information to you for you, I will make sure to give that to you. Friends, with that, uh, at this moment in time, I encourage you to center yourselves and your hearts in prayer. The way that we help to do that here at Redford Aldersgate is by singing together, Spirit of the Living God.
Let us pray. O holy God, when everything first began, water became a symbol of refreshing, of washing away, of renewing. And through the waters of creation, you brought forth abundant life. We have gathered this day, even in virtual spaces, to remember Jesus' baptism. How when he came up out of the water, your spirit proclaimed that he was your beloved son in whom you were very well pleased. Our spirits resound with that proclamation. In his baptism, Jesus' ministry was initiated. He dedicated his life to you completely and without reservation. Help us to dedicate our lives to you, to offer our best for you, to be in service to you by serving your world. As we have lifted before you the names of people near and dear to us who are in need of your healing touch and your tender mercies, we also lift ourselves up as people in need of your grace. Our world is in the midst of strife, war, oppression, famine, hunger, alienation, deep divisions, insurrection, and violence at home. Situations in which we have abused the world and one another. Heal us and this world, Lord. Renew us with your life-giving waters and reaffirm our baptism as your children. And let us go forth to be people of peace and mercy today. So God, hear our voices now as we raise them together before you to pray in earnest the words that Jesus taught to us. As we say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who've trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Remember your baptism. And be thankful. Friends, let us now join together in singing our song of response. Spirit of faith, come down.
us pray. O holy and gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This past week on January 6th, we ended the season of Christmas and we entered into a new season called Epiphany. It's one of those markers in the story of Christ that leads us deeper into the mystery of God. Mystics from the East come to find the Christ child guided by a star. It's the melding of religious belief and early scientific understanding, knowing and recognizing that God is doing something in our midst and in our world. The season of Epiphany has always been about seeing the light that is Jesus the Christ, breaking forth into the world in which we live. But seeing is only the first step. The presence of Christ calls forth a response in our lives. And today we begin a new series called Where You Lead, about the church and each of us that make up the body of Christ, our response to that light, to walk in the path of Jesus each and every day, to follow. It is the mission of the church to make disciples, even as we are being made disciples. It is an ongoing process to follow Jesus, a transformation that continues through every stage of our lives. We come again and again. Where do you lead, O Lord? Hear this word this morning that comes to us from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 4 through 11. John was preaching in the wilderness, calling for people to be baptized to show that they were changing their hearts and lives and wanted God to forgive their sins. Everyone in Judea and all the people of Jerusalem went out to the Jordan River and were being baptized by John as they confessed their sins. John wore clothes made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. He ate locusts and wild honey. He announced, One stronger than I am is coming after me. I'm not even worthy to bend over and loosen the strap of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And about that time, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, and John baptized him in the Jordan River. And while he was coming up out of the Jordan, Jesus saw heaven splitting down and the Spirit like a dove coming down upon him. And there was a voice from heaven, You are my Son, whom I dearly love, and you I am well pleased. It's the word of God for the people of God for which we say, Thanks be to God. Amen. All four Gospels tell a bit of Jesus' baptism, but each one of them does it in their own way. Notice from our reading this morning that there's nothing here about John's preaching like we find in Matthew and Luke's gospel. There's nothing about the conversation between Jesus and John that we find in the gospel of John. It's just over with, right? It happens really fast. There's no actual description of the baptism at all. Jesus came to be baptized, and then he was coming up out of the water, and he saw what he saw, and it's like we skipped over the event itself, like it was just gone. And given how much the church throughout its history has spent uh, going over the myth, uh, methodology and theology of baptism, the long arguments and questions about how it should, should be done and what we should think about it, you would think that there might be some more detail here. This is a pretty big moment. It's almost as if, at least for the Gospel of Mark, the real importance is on what happens after. Do you remember your baptism? I mean, some of you probably do. Those of you who were baptized as youth or adults, you might remember it really well if you've been baptized within the last few years, right? But many don't as well, right? Because it happened before they could remember anything. I was baptized as an infant in the church that I grew up in uh, by a pastor whose name I cannot remember for the life of me because uh, it was before I could remember anything. It was before I could even think about church. And yet those of us who remember our baptism only because someone told us about it much later, we can still remember what happened afterward, right? 
So perhaps the Gospel of Mark is some comfort to those of us who can't recall the details of the day, but know that the life we live as baptized followers of Jesus is that afterward. The new creation that we choose to make ourselves every single day of our lives is that afterward. Where you lead, Lord. And the new creation that we are and are becoming is a mixture of word and spirit. There are words pronounced over us in our baptism. There are words spoken to us by a congregation. And there is a spirit that is conferred from God and the community of faith. And we are remade. A new creation, a fresh start. But we need reminders. Of course we need reminders. Of our baptism. It's too much of an event to keep in our hearts all the time, ever before us. We forget what a transformative moment baptism is. We forget that everything old is, is torn away, like the heavens were rent apart, as Mark says. We forget that our orientation is from that moment, our new life is claimed in that moment. We forget that what we are looking for, longing for, is already ours in that moment. We'll lose our grip. We'll forget that it even happened. We're still running and we're still looking for what we already have. This past week was one of those weeks where it's it's hard to remember the promises made in our baptisms. the start of the season of epiphany this past week was like a punch in the gut instead and not only did we experience several days of record-breaking covid deaths after having already been through the same thing the previous week but we bore witness to the destruction of a core value of our nation's democracy the peaceful transition of power That degradation of our ideals was fed and fostered by willful lies and deceit from those in power, in positions of authority, and chief among them, President Trump. I listened to President-elect Biden's speech urging President Trump to call off his supporters in attacking the Capitol building. And in that message, Biden said something that's worth considering for a moment. He said, this is not who we are. Respectfully, I disagree. This is who we are. We are a nation rent over our long, undressed wounds. We are a nation divided by economics and race, ideology, and much, much more. And so we are afraid. We're afraid of others. We're afraid of losing power, sometimes even afraid of being treated like we know others are. And so we mask that fear with a flag or an easy slogan or even a cross, any of which we believe provides some security or sense of belonging in some factious way. I know this is who we are because as painful as the images were, they revealed some thinly veiled truths. Like the Confederate flag traipsed through the Capitol building, something that even General Lee never managed. Or those openly sporting Nazi paraphernalia storming toward an evacuating Congress. The ease of violence and playful destruction of lives and historic artifacts. The presence of IEDs, Molotov cocktails, firearms, zip ties, those old but ever-present signs of our nakedness, our shame, and our oppression. These images were meant to send A message, one that compounds on the fears of those that they target, meant to lay claim to a thing, the halls of power, and that those that bore them fear they have lost those powers to those they target. 
They were accompanied by cries of heads on pikes, string them up. It's not their America, it's our America. As a show of force of white supremacy, it was a display of evil at work in our world. We are a society of multiple Americas. And in being such, we have foregone dealing with the brutality of our brokenness in exchange for a weak peace that pacifies those wounded and placates those doing the wounding without ever addressing a need for justice and accounting of things, a redress. So we have remained fractured susceptible to deceit and cynical ploys by those who would prey upon that brokenness for their own gain. Beloved, these are perilous days, but they are not unknown in the history of humankind, nor are they untouched by the church. And so we stand at a crossroads between what was and what will be. What will we make of it? Ever that question is before us, but it is most striking when we can feel the weight of the moment. It is a question present in our baptisms as well. We emerge from the waters reborn, having put to rest all life absent the light and love of God guiding our lives. Where you lead, O Lord, what will we make of it? What will we do? Remember Your baptism isn't just an empty ritual for Sunday mornings. It is a way of living that keeps our eyes open for the descending doves of the Spirit, the Spirit of truth. It is a choice that we can claim to embrace the possibilities in front of us instead of the fears within us. It is an opportunity to know that we are loved and claimed and that whatever valleys of shadow are hiding away in our past or in our hearts, They need not define us anymore. When we remember and accept that, we move toward peace. But there is no peace without justice. And there is no justice without forgiveness, and there is no forgiveness absent love. And what we have witnessed this past week was brokenness in the absence of love. Decisions made entirely out of fear and evil. As a church, in our baptism, it is a family that we've entered into, one who will run with us as we search for what we are looking for and who will avoid saying, told you so, when we realize that what we are looking for has been with us the entire time. So friends, the tearing continues. The heavens rent, the nation torn asunder, yet in that breaking open, There is opportunity for something new and hopeful to enter in. The remaking continues. Our lives are constantly being taken apart and put back together. And whether we see it descending on us like a dove or not, the Spirit is a constant companion throughout our lives. It is what inspires us to love and serve and learn and grow. It is what equips us to be a part of the body of Christ in unique and powerful ways. It is what tears us open to new ways of living and new ways of being. It is what enables us to call evil, evil, and good, good, and to not confuse the two. So let us not be cowed by fear, for perfect love casts out all fear. Let us face difficult truths about who we are as a people. Let us seek justice, addressing what is evil, repentance, offering an opportunity for those who perpetuate evil to turn away from that death, and then, and only then, reconciliation between what is good and worthy of a future. We need to take an opportunity as a whole to set aside that which is evil in our midst. That which causes us to be afraid and angry and hurtful. That which brings up domination, supremacy, hatred.
Those things need to be put to their end. So that each and every single one of us can walk into the light. Can walk in pathways of peace. And whether we hear it or not, the word that is spoken over us, even now, is an affirmation. You are loved. God continuously offers that to us. You are loved. God sees the light placed within us and pronounces that light good. Where you lead, Lord. What will we make of it? The voice proclaims from heaven, you are my beloved, and with you I am well pleased. Not done, not complete, not perfect, but there is good. In God's eyes, there is good. Let us lift that up. Let us be that. Let us turn away from all that would seek to tear us down. And let it be so. Amen. My friends, God has laid claim on your life. By your baptism, you have been marked as God's own forever. In grace, may God watch over you. In strength, may you go forth in service. May your hearts ever be filled with the light and love of God in Jesus Christ. So let us share in our benediction together. Say these words powerfully, friends, for they are ours. Go in peace, love God, and serve others. Amen.